Right, good evening ladies and gentlemen, we'll make a start. I think that clock behind us is a couple of minutes fast, but uh, we'll get the parish notices out of the way as we usually do. Welcome to this uh, October meeting of the Friends. I'm not certain where that photograph came from. Someone's trying to remind me of my recent holidays in Australia, I think, but that's not, that's not one of mine and I wouldn't stand in that position to take a photograph, I assure you. Um, if there is an emergency and we're not expecting any uh, fire alarms to ring and hopefully they won't um, but if they do now that the stairway is clear um, the exit will be through the way you came in down the stairs or if that's in any way blocked off uh, through the uh, exit to your right and to my left uh, mobile phones off please if you'd be so kind um, just looking ahead uh, and taking my cue from the magazine which should have plopped onto your uh, doormats uh, either today or Saturday. Um, our next meeting here in exactly one month's time, four weeks' time, uh, is uh, a talk by David Humphrey uh, entitled I Tried to Run a Bus Company. Um, I think actually he ran uh, quite a number of bus companies, but he's probably most uh, easily rec uh, remembered as the uh, managing director of London United. Uh, through its uh, privatisation uh, and David will be talking about his uh, experiences of, of running uh, bus companies uh, at that meeting on the 25th of November. Immediately prior to that on the 21st of November there will be one of our um, meetings at uh, Acton Depot in the afternoon. Uh, that will be Ian Reid who's the uh, Heritage Bus Manager for the Friends working closely with the museum in that capacity uh, and he will give an overview of uh, what's involved in operating the museum's uh, Heritage Bus fleet out on the road carrying passengers as it should really be doing. Uh, and that's on Thursday the 21st of November. There are a number of visits uh, and walks and lunches uh, and something called a Highland Fling in the far north west of Scotland uh, in early January. Um, all of those details are in the magazine and if you're interested please follow the booking instructions that are given therein. Um, I need to say something about the special trip we're planning on the FRM uh, to mark the 50th anniversary of its introduction as a one-man vehicle in Croydon uh, in 1969. Uh, that trip will happen, uh, but it will not happen on the date that's mentioned in the magazine. Uh, we're still finalising the details of that. Uh, both as to date and itinerary. Uh, there will be a limited, given the fact that there is only the capacity of the vehicle, uh, a limited number of places for friends to join that trip uh, in December, uh, but the details of that will be available initially probably in an email, uh, but will undoubtedly be known by the time we meet here next in November. So I say don't, don't be guided by the date, uh, but the, uh, the event will happen. Uh, what you will get by email tomorrow, those of you who are on the email list, uh, is notification that Christmas has come early to the London Transport Museum shop and to its friends, uh, and there is a discount of 30% across almost every line. The there is a little asterisk which says terms and conditions apply and there are certain exceptions. Uh, but there is uh, just for the period leading up to and immediately, I think immediately before Christmas, 24th of December it finishes, uh, a standard discount for friends of 30%. Uh, having tried it just now, uh, the technology of the till was having a little bit of trouble dealing with 30% discounts. But um, hopefully that will be dealt with by the time you try it uh, or you can get the same discount online, but I say the details of that will be in an email which should be coming out tomorrow. Uh, that's all I need to say, I think, by way of parish notices. Uh, so we shall proceed straight to our speaker, a speaker who, as they say, needs no introduction. Chris is familiar to many of you who know him in his museum capacity here uh, as assistant director, uh, but also he's spoken from this very platform uh, on the very subject he's talking about again, which is Hidden London. Um, always popular. Um, something which has grown from just the occasional tours of Aldwych now to a very extensive programme of visits to uh, a whole variety of sites. Uh, it has spawned an exhibition which is upstairs. Hopefully some of you may have had the chance to see it today. If you haven't, do come and have a look. It is excellent. Uh, and there is a best-selling book. I gather it's a best-selling book. It's already gone to its first reprint. 
Indeed, so there we go. If anybody's got a copy, I'm sure Chris will be happy to sign it for you. Um, anyway, Chris is going to explain how we got to the Hidden London programme as it is now and may even give us a little insight as to where it's going next. Chris. Thank you very much. Good start. Well, good evening, and uh, thank you for those of you who've been to uh, one of my talks about Hidden London before. Hopefully, I'll give you some new instalments. Uh, and I know, just looking around the room, that we have some very discerning uh, audience who I, I, I know are the first to uh, want to be through the door uh, on any new Hidden London experience. And I know also we're, we're streaming on YouTube tonight, too. So, what I wanted to do was just explain a little bit where this phenomena of Hidden London had come from, uh, and also how we've gone about creating the programme of tours, the exhibition that's just opened, and the book uh, that came out last month. And to begin with, uh, I just want to go back a very, very long time ago, several decades uh, ago, the museum started running tours uh, at a couple of the sites, uh, like Oldwich, uh, Down Street, and indeed Holborn. Um, our um, uh, yearbook uh, from 1991 found itself very surprised to be uh, photocopied and included uh, in this presentation. But that's really the first example I can see of where the museum uh, started running such, such tours and satisfying the curiosity to get behind the scenes. I myself came here uh, 20 years ago now when the Jubilee Line extension first opened and I ran uh, tours on those stations as they started to open uh, and eventually finished opening in uh, December of 99. Um, from there, the museum had aspirations to do more of this. We were always getting um, requests for, can you do more tours? Can you do tours at sites that we haven't uh, had access to before? Uh, and they always seem to be sold out as soon as they go on sale. Can you do more of them? Now, the museum wanted to be able to do that, but actually in the early 2000s, the timing wasn't right. Uh, TfL had been created, it was concentrating on getting the underground fighting fit, uh, and all of its efforts went into doing that. So you may be aware that things like station gardens uh, were not seen as a priority, and basically anything that was a bit ancillary to running the underground was put on the back burner. Also, there have been various security concerns after... Um, 9-11, uh, uh, where TfL wanted to just focus on keeping its, uh, its borders closed and only focusing on the public areas uh, for people. Um, and so it really wasn't the right time for us to be expanding that programme. However, we did get involved uh, in celebrating certain events like uh, Anniversary of the Blitz. You may remember we did a... Uh, Let's inspired event at Oldwich, uh, complete with actors and bring our 38 stock train into there. And that continued to demonstrate that there really was an appetite uh, for, uh, for getting behind the scenes of the transport system. And it also attracted quite a, a broad audience, to say the least. So we thought, mm, there's definitely something in this. So in 2014, uh, the museum went back to Transport for London and said, look, we think the time is right. We think we've demonstrated that uh, we can run these tours without causing any issue for you. And actually, it reminds people of all of those things that they love about the underground. So uh, rather than just focusing on their daily commute and how well that's going, people actually love the underground. and They love to be able to see behind the scenes. Uh, and so in 2014, uh, TfL said, yeah, OK, time is right. What would you do if we said, yes, you could expand it? Now, this was kind of the moment I'd been waiting for for about 15 years at that point. Um, I knew a lot of these places. I'd have the, had the privilege of going into them 20, 19 years ago. Uh, and uh, so there was quite a long list of places that we thought would be um, reasonably easily, moderately difficult, and nigh on impossible to try and uh, open up uh, for tours. They are, of course, all interesting, but not, of them, not all of them are particularly viable. 
Uh, so we generated a list um, and uh, we also thought about all the other things we could do in the fullness of time, like an exhibition maybe or possibly a book and a bunch of other things which are yet to come. And then we set about actually doing it, going to these sites, looking at um, which ones had the best stories, which ones we had really good materials for so we could bring them back to life. Um, and uh, also what works we would have to do to the sites to make it safe to take uh, a broad audience in there. And uh, since 2014, we have, uh, as many of you know, uh, been uh, opening up tours at Charing Cross, Clapham South. This was actually the order in which we did them. Uh, Down Street, Old Witch, 55 Broadway, alas, no longer with us. The last one ran uh, a weekend or two back. Uh, and in fact, did I see Paul? Paul, you did the last one, didn't you? Did. Paul Burke. Ah, superb. I can think. I didn't know you were there. That's, that's brilliant that you were there. Uh, as a lot of the material about how it was to work in 55 Broadway came from uh, Mr. Lejeune himself. Uh, Euston. I'm just going to pause there because all of those we did in the space of 12 months. That's like doing uh, six temporary exhibitions from start to finish in a year. That was quite an intense year, that one. Then we focused on running those and uh, getting the capacity of those tours uh, as, as great as we could. And then we added Highgate, there's a bit of a gap, and then this year we've just added Piccadilly Circus. Could you put your hands up if you have been on one of those tours? Ah, lovely. Superb, that was almost all the audience. Um, put your hand up if you've been on all of them. Yes, uh, a few guides. <laughs> so that's good. Thank you. Um, can I ask, have you enjoyed them? Yes. Excellent, good. Well, that's why we did it, because we thought you would. Uh, we know we do. Uh, are we still there? Oh, that's good. Sorry, I just went for a moment. Um, that's great. Uh, we want people to go and enjoy these things. Right back in 2014, when we were looking at words that should define what we were trying to do, fun kept on coming up as uh, the, the one that needed to sit near the top. Um, this year has been extremely busy. Um, we've had the, uh, the book uh, launched, uh, published by Yale University Press, uh, and the exhibition has opened. And again, just show of hands, please. Who's been in the exhibition already? Okay, all right, so some of you still to go and explore. Um, what I want to do now is just talk about how we've gone about devising each of those three things, the tours, the book, and the exhibition. So there's a process to doing this. We have to, first of all, go and have a look at any site that we think might be in London tour. And sometimes that's as far as it gets. It might be that, for whatever reason, it's just not suitable. We need to dig through archive. We're very big on primary research. We are a, a museum. We're an accredited museum. We can't just kind of recycle uh, secondary stuff uh, that might exist in books. We often use that as a starting point. But we have to go back to archive and make sure it's true. There's all sorts of fun stories about these places that exist, particularly on the internet, sometimes in print. Not all of them are true. Uh, so we have to make sure that they are, uh, and also discover new stuff that perhaps others haven't. Um, we uh, will go back through our oral history archive, and in some cases uh, record new uh, oral histories. Uh, we commission new photography, we scour our own uh, photography, not all of which is catalogued like many museums or all museums. In fact, we have uh, a fair amount of our collection uh, is not yet catalogued. So uh, we've been using uh, this uh, program as an opportunity to dig through and do uh, more cataloguing in areas uh, that relate to hidden London. Then sometimes we have to do really boring but important stuff like pouring concrete to level off floors, uh, paying people to put up handrails, paint edges yellow so that fewer people will trip or crack their head on something. And at the end of it, if we have a tour, we often end up with these things that we refer to as leftovers. 
the things which don't go into the tour that might be suitable for either the next tour, the book, the exhibition. And all of these uh, three areas, the book, the tours, the exhibition, all tend to uh, support each other by generating vast amounts of extra knowledge, information uh, and products that can be recycled into creating uh, the next thing. So let's just have a look at what this can mean. So, um, the physical survey, uh, you can see there on the left hand side, that's a typical first through the door uh, look at a station. Anybody know which one that is? Paul, I'd better rule you out because you, you, you really ought to get all of these and no doubt will. Uh, any offers? Oh, well done. Oh, very specific. Charing Cross Trafalgar Square. Uh, it's the construction tunnel. Now, that was actually in 2013. It was the very first one that we looked at uh, bringing into the fold. I jumped the gun before we had the approval in 2014 uh, and got in there. And you can see a pile of works equipment on the right hand side. Still to this day there is a different pile of works equipment stacked to the right hand side but it was going around and working out whether that was a problem or whether that could be mitigated or made safe, uh, removed very occasionally. Um, and then the one on the right was a, a delightful uh, moment that uh, myself, Sidney Holloway, who's the engagement manager for Hidden London, uh, my partner in Grime, usually the first through the door on these places, and uh, Mike Dupre, who's one of our front of house supervisors who did a lot of the early work with us. Um, this is when we went to uh, Moorgate, uh, to do a survey and we discovered that our route through Moorgate was blocked by, well, I'll, I'll just run the video and you can have a look. So in order to carry on exploring that passageway we had to bail out, we think, somewhere around 350 litres of water out of the passageway and into the blocked drain uh, in order to be able to go and have a look. It was worth it. Uh, Moorgate uh, will be one of the next tours to uh, join the family um, and uh, we've only been waiting so long to introduce it because it's being oversailed by uh, Crossrail construction so we couldn't, uh, couldn't take through people through a passageway in case part of the ticket hall arrived in it while we were using it. Um, sometimes we have to do investigations. Now, um, this is myself, Mike and Siddy doing a little investigation at uh, Clapham South. Um, the very first time I visited this place, I walked through it and um, I said to the TfL landlord, that's an interesting set of bricks. That looks like an old doorway to me. He said, oh yeah, I've been wondering about that. And I had to keep quiet about it for about three years and only uh, two other people spotted it in that time. City was one of them, uh, and asked me, "So what? What's that then?" Because it didn't appear on any plans. It looked like kind of age of brick. That hmm, could it be early fifties? It's that kind of wonder where that goes. We're already thirty six meters below ground. What does that connect to? Um, and we had to know the answer. It's just not responsible to. Uh, be a tenant on a building and have a void that you don't know anything about behind a wall. Uh, so we got permission uh, and we went in and drilled some holes, one for the torch, one for the camera. And imagine our surprise and excitement when we found, is it a pipe? Is it a cable? That's definitely a ladder. But where does it go? Does it go up? Does it go down? Well, we then had to keep really quiet about that because uh, there's quite a few people in the audience here tonight who would get very excited about knowing that there might be a tunnel that goes somewhere else. Um, and uh, we had to keep our powder dry until we could get permission to actually demolish part of the wall enough to be able to get in and have a look, um, which we did. And we were desperate to find out what was behind. Could it go down and connect into other deep level shelters, as is often rumoured. Uh, the answer was no, it was a cable tunnel uh, to connect power cables from the station into the two plant rooms. Uh, it was clearly an addition that was made after uh, the site was already under construction as the, uh, the rings in there are all 
uh, bear LPTB markings in the date of 1941. So uh, they clearly had to order them after they'd begun uh, the construction at the beginning of 1941, and somebody had forgotten to include a power cable route uh, for the backup cables from the station uh, to the deep shelter. Um, huge amount of work just to find out what lay behind those uh, those bricked that bricked up uh, doorway, but could have been all sorts of things. So we had to rule out uh, and know what it was. Um, City and I spend a lot of time in archive, um, both our own, so TfL archive, the museum's archives, uh, and also places like Churchill archive, uh, Metropolitan archives, uh, and so on. Um, that can often yield really um, helpful things. So, for example, this was a very early bringing together of a couple of our drawings uh, for Euston um, when we were uh, designing that tour uh, for 2016. And um, hidden away, you can see some things which don't often appear, so the original City in South London tunnels down there, as well as the probably more familiar Melton Street uh, one over there. There was, however, the, this little passageway here, which, if anybody's made it that far through the book, um, was uh, something which we were spent to spend three years following up on to find out exactly what that tunnel was, why it was built, who for and when. We'll come back to that in the book. Um, we often get the privilege of meeting some incredible people. So there's Margaret Barford, a uh, lovely lady who spent nearly two years of her life uh, from the age of 10 till 12 living in uh, Clapham South in Grenville Shelter. We brought her back with three generations of her family uh, to uh, after we'd uh, recorded her, her memories, incredibly sharp memories for a 10-year-old uh, at the time. Um, and really helped to flesh out some of the uh, living conditions in the site during the war. And then uh, a gentleman called uh, Bernard Masson on the right. Uh, we were introduced to both of these people through the Clapham Society, who had done earlier oral history recordings of them. Uh, and um, Bernard, we quote on the tour, uh, he described going to Clapham South uh, during the Festival of Britain, and he had... Um, uh, described the conditions as very, very, very primitive. And um, I was taking a, a group from the, uh, from the Clapham Society round uh, the shelter and repeated this line in front of the display panel uh, when a voice from the back said, no, I didn't. <laughs> and I looked over and I said, uh, Bernard Masson, I presume. He said, yes. And he said, I'm only joking. No, I did say it, it was absolutely awful. Uh, very, uh, But um, it was great because it meant that I got to come and explore London and I liked it so much, I stayed here. Uh, so he was originally uh, French uh, and naturalised to uh, the UK. Um, he also told me that he used to leave his bike unlocked up on the common. Uh, and it was there every time he went back up. And uh, I said, uh, well, you've lived in London long enough to know that you shouldn't repeat that trick and expect it still to be there. Uh, photography is also a big, uh, a big part of uh, what we what we do, both raking through our own archive and commissioning uh, new stuff. And we've had the uh, privilege of working with some really great uh, photographers uh, who later worked on on the book, uh, Andy Davis and uh, Toby Madden, uh, who've got a, a good eye for how to bring the best out of uh, our stations. Um, sometimes we do have to really uh, get serious and do some works, though. So this, uh, again, show hands, please, who's been on the Euston tour? Oh, crikey, that's a lot. Okay, okay, good, good. In which case, when you went there, you probably remember this as being nicely levelled off with concrete. And when you went into the vent shaft, it's got kickboards and uh, plywood and proper handrails. We did all that. Um, that was a prerequisite to being able to get into uh, that site. Uh, in the case of Highgate, um, sometimes we just can't mitigate for the difficulty that exists. In this case, all of these tunnels are occupied by bats, a protected species, and therefore we just can't go in there for tours. Um, but you may have noticed if you've been in the exhibition, we've determinedly brought that story into the exhibition. 
Uh, also, uh, there was a problem with a canopy and falling masonry, so we had to get people to wear hard hats as part of that. And then this is us just in a very early stage walking around uh, the station, working out where's the best place to put a group of 22 people without restricting flow when it's when it's busy and where's the best place to advance each story point of the narrative uh, we then have to recruit and train uh, guides and our cs team so that they can deliver a flawless performance every time keep everybody safe not only take them in but also bring everybody out again in one piece uh, and on time and of course write the booklet to go with it um, so there's quite a lot of moving parts and therefore a fair bit of time involved in creating each one of those tours. If you imagine doing that six times over in the space of a year, uh, that, that was quite an intense first 12 months of Hidden London. But whenever we do this, as I say, we always get leftovers. We find letters uh, such as uh, this one, uh, from uh, Winston Churchill to the chair of the Railway Executive Committee uh, that was quite useful uh, later on uh, when we came to write the book. Um, tunnels such as this one uh, in a station. Anybody guess where that is? Oh, I'd be seriously impressed. I won't labour this too long. No, exactly. This is a, a tunnel which may yet find its way into a, into a tour. Um, but was one that we just strayed across in a station, not really knowing it was there, but just asking to see everything when we were going looking around about four years ago. And so we move on to the book. The book um, was being created in a world where there are already a number of fine publications on the subject of disused or abandoned stations. Sorry. Um, and so we had to think about how it would exist within uh, a world with those uh, publications so as not to compete, but to add or to bring the subject to a, a new audience. We wanted it to be uh, satisfying for both uh, cognoscenti, those people who know the subject well, uh, but also uh, easily accessible for people who'd never uh, come across the subject of Hidden London before. Therefore, we thought, hmm, good visuals. Um, and not just uh, uh, historic photos of stations, but as they exist today, our poster collection, uh, postcards, uh, drawings, and other things which, when you add them together, create um, a, a strong visual narrative, which is then supported by text rather than a text-heavy book, which is occasionally brightened up by some photos. Um, that meant that we had to commission new photography, about 40 uh, photographic days uh, in order to complete that. Um, we had to do a lot of new physical survey. Uh, we had to spend yet more time in archive. We commissioned some new oral histories. And again, we ended up with a bunch of bits that were quite useful for the exhibition. And in the order in which we did these three main components of Hidden London, the tours came first the book came second, and the exhibition was happening in parallel with the early stages of the book, uh, but then was finished after the book was done. Uh, so there were some elements of it that were able to go on in parallel uh, and inform one another, uh, and other bits which uh, came um, as a result of having done uh, the tours and the book. So, um, we had to, it's terrible this, we had to go everywhere on the system uh, that might be visually or historically interesting. We decided the book uh, was best delivered as a thematic book, which, uh, after an initial introduction, uh, features on case studies of uh, what we felt were the most interesting examples of certain types of disuse and reuse. And then we added all of, well, most of the other disused stations that were similar into each of those case studies. So you kind of get a general approach to, for example, a station that um, uh, has lift shafts uh, and is then converted to escalators, has an awful lot of abandoned 
uh, passageway and uh, lift shaft, a lot of those stories are quite similar thereafter that they get used for ventilation. Some get used for wall use and so on. So we were trying to group stations by the type of story that they personified. King William Street, however, uh, being the, the granddaddy of them, uh, the oldest abandoned tube, as distinct from underground, um, uh, it was a rare opportunity to get inside that whilst the works on the bank extension project are going on. So this is myself, Siddy, and Sam uh, going there along with a photographer. We were just checking in that lower photo that the toilet cubicles were actually uh, uh, suitable size for people. Um, we spent yet more time in archive and we managed to fathom out the story behind this uh, passageway here. If you've been on the Euston tour, the bit where you walked through into the Victoria Line ventilation system, uh, we say that piece of tunnel was built for the Victoria Line. Actually, it's not quite that simple. The very first bit of it, uh, the bit that's straight, was actually built in 1937 by London Transport at the request of London Midland Scottish Railway to give them an emergency telephone exchange something that was not widely known or understood, uh, but we were able to piece together through the diagrams that we hold, uh, the telephone connection diagrams that we hold, and also physical survey on the ground. It had been bugging me for about six months, that, when I first saw some very obvious doorways and drains. I wonder where they go. Uh, uh, this was the telephone connections diagram, uh, which we'll see displayed in the exhibition, which I found about two years ago in our uncatalogued drawing collection. It shows everywhere that Down Street was connected to uh, in order to run the country, uh, both military, uh, mainline railway, and my personal favourite, just up there, uh, Coles Hill RCH. Anybody know what, uh, what happened at Coles Hill during the war? Richard, do you know? Well done. It was a training facility specifically for the LDV, also known as Dad's Army, but it was the sabotage division. So Down Street had a hotline, as did the War Office and the Emergency War Office, so presumably if we were invaded, uh, they would be told to blow the bridges and disrupt the enemy's advance. So quite the fascinating diagram uh, from Deep Dean to LMS Bletchley. Uh, it's, it's rather nice to see where it was connected to. Um, also, um, the complete listing of all of the London transport uh, telephone, wartime telephone connections, again, showing you where the different headquarters were uh, and the different disused facilities that were included as part of that network. Um, we had enormous fun going to some very impressive places and taking very, very slow exposure, uh, very carefully lit uh, shots um, and trying to create the definitive library of images of these spaces. Uh, I've included a few that didn't make it into the book that might have been some of my personal favourites. Uh, anybody say where that one is? Oh, very good. Uh, sorry, I should have done that one, of course. Chorus. Very good, yes, down street. Uh, and go on now. Oh, he's on fire, it's Brompton Road. Um. <clears throat> it's a good answer, but as they say on catchphrase, it's not right. Sorry, what's that one? Nope, sorry. Not King William Street. We've already had the answer. It's South Kensington again. <laughs> Anyone? Street. It's not Gooch Street. It's a good guess, though. Holborn? It's not Holborn. It's another one that had wartime adaptation. Dover Street. Oh, very good. Dover Street. Okay. And so we come to the exhibition. Well, the logic behind the exhibition uh, was that we know there are a lot of places which people can't access. Uh, we know that there are many places which are, have been uh, gutted after they were 
reused ingeniously and are so gone forever. We also know that there's a lot of people who would love to come on the Hidden London tours, but for a variety of reasons can't access them. Uh, it might be uh, that they find it physically difficult to get into what are inherently inaccessible spaces. Uh, it might be that they find it a little bit too claustrophobic, but they're still curious about it. Uh, it might be they're too young, or it might be they can't afford uh, the price tag. We are aware that these are not in considerable price tags to come on these tours, but opening them up is an inherently expensive uh, and staff-heavy business. So we wanted to be able to... Uh, broaden the access of this. Maybe people who've been thinking about coming on a tour for a while, uh, but weren't quite sure if it was for them. So, challenge. How do you recreate some of that experience in an exhibition? Uh, well, we felt that we could make it more exploratory in nature uh, and experiential in nature than just a, a flat wall uh, exhibit and text uh, kind of exhibition. We commissioned new videography and sound recording, uh, set works uh, companies. We did yet more physical surveys to make sure that we get it right. Um, back to archive, more oral histories, more photography. And we also had an ace up our sleeves, which, which isn't on this list. Uh, our friend at York Road, Steve Cates, the man who is responsible for trying to reuse and recycle as many things that come off the system as possible and get them, if possible, back onto the system somewhere. So cable hangers, CCTV cameras, doors, signage. And if they can't go back onto the system, why not become a very realistic part of uh, the Hidden London exhibition, which is what we did. We do have some fabulous objects in our collection uh, for each of the tour sites that we do. So uh, this ticket counter, who can tell me where that used to live? Aldwych, specifically where? That's a good answer. Well, very good. Lift, even the right lift number. Thank you. Um, so this was the ticket counter for selling your ticket uh, as you uh, were in the lift on the way down to be one of the incredibly small number of people who used to use Aldwych. Um, okay, who can tell me where this one is? Oh, very good. Um, we were delighted when we went to do, do the photography on this because they're painted on the wall and in the background are the two reasons that the station really didn't work. A 1 in 36 uh, incline, which is already pretty tough, uh, turning to a 1 in 14 on a sharp curve. Uh, that is why King William Street was not a technical success. Um, far too steep and tight a curve, uh, following as it did the curve of the road uh, to get the way leave up Swan Lane and Arthur Street uh, into the platforms. Uh, again, anybody like to guess where this one is? Oh, who said that? That, well, that was very impressive. Is that Bill? Yes. Oh, I thought it was. Sorry, you're in the shadows there, so I got that by the voice. Um, so that's the old signal. <laughs> of course, it's the old signal cabin. That's <laughs> well done, Bill. Um, and uh, this one, one of the most impressive. It's a very dark photo, I know, but it's a ventilation shaft. It's also your probability. Very good. The trick question passed. So... Um, this was actually one of the most unnerving places that we went to because when we went in through the door, walked out over, you might just be able to make out, it's one of these kind of grill floors. And all you could feel was wind coming up from it and the sound of distant trains. So you knew you were walking out over a void. Uh, I hadn't done my homework properly before going there, so I, didn't act I had hadn't actually twigged that it was 34 metres deep. So by the time we actually put a torch down it, there was this sort of moment of your brain working out what you stood over and just coming to terms with it. Uh, yeah, that was quite the surprise, that one, but a very impressive station, York Road. Features heavily in the book and in the exhibition. Massive station uh, for one that got shut so early. We also got to do some really fun things like uh, taking down the boards over the Down Street name, uh, we think for the first time since it was put up there uh, when it closed. Um, uh, I can confirm that 
uh, due to the fact a canopy was fitted to the station later on in its life before it shut. Uh, the letter D and T have gone, so it now says Onstri Station underneath it. Um, there is talk of the possibility of maybe reinstating that with the underground's help uh, and having it proudly uh, describe its name again uh, without the boards there. And then bottom right, any guesses for where that is? The photo was taken in 1956. Oh, who said that? Oh, very good. You're, you're, you're doing very well this evening. This is the construction of North End Bull and Bush uh, um, uh, control facilities for, uh, for the floodgates. Uh, on the system when they were being relocated from Leicester Square uh, to a much harder target underneath uh, Hampstead Hill. Um, quite a deep facility, not as uh, some uh, things say on the internet, the deepest on the system that was never built. Uh, it's, it's quite a bit shallower than Hampstead, but nonetheless still quite a healthy walk down those stairs uh, into the facility below. Um, and then the final part of the exhibition is all about how life underground is uh, and what it's like to work there, to shelter there if war uh, is occurring, or simply to um, go about cleaning or maintaining or upgrading uh, the system. And uh, one of my favourite uh, things, which you can go and see if you can find in the exhibition, uh, as an object is uh, a little Santa Barbara. Does anybody know why we have a Santa Barbara in the exhibition and why you see one here in the entrance to the bank extension project? Very good. Uh, patron saint of tunnelers and miners. Um, and uh, Dragados, who are the company who are uh, working the bank extension project, a uh, Spanish company, so, you know, Patron saints are not going to go missing. However, I do notice um, that it uh, had added on its little box, pray for us, by somebody. Uh, and then just next to the us, somebody had put B-O-N uh, to get pray for bonus. I did ask them when I went back last week whether their prayers had been answered, and they said not so far. So, um, oh. I was going to ask you this one. I've already given you the answer. Uh, the the what's next in the tours? Um, those were my clues to the answer I've already blurted out uh, for what you can see uh, at the, the next tour we intend to uh, offer at Moorgate. So my apologies for those of you who would have managed to get that. Last time I tried this, nobody got it. Um, but we also have been keeping a gentle eye on some much more modern stuff uh, in the form of uh, Crossrail and the Elizabeth Line. I did say that 20 years ago my first job here at the museum was uh, the Jubilee Line extension as that was starting to open. Um, and the point at which Elizabeth Line starts to open is the point at which we'd like to be able to offer tours, uh, in some cases, for things which are hidden in plain sight. They are, like the JLE stations at the time, they are remarkable. And as you start to use them, uh, there will be all sorts of things that you will walk past without knowing the clever things that are there. So we do think that those will be quite satisfying tours as the JLE ones were 20 years ago and still occasionally are today. Um, uh, and that is the end of that bit of the presentation but I have a bonus for you that was a quick canter through how we have devised all the things uh, that we have devised over the last five years of Hidden London however, last Friday I got to go back to the bank extension project and I thought you might like to see that yes? Excellent. OK, well, let's jump in. So for those of you who don't know, uh, the Bank Extension Project is uh, um, a £655 million project to resolve uh, a long-standing issue of a station that has accreted rather than been designed. Usual story, uh, rival railway companies start building stations. Uh, they use the available way leave to build their stations and eventually 
when they get big and complex and interchangey, somebody has to come along and try and make it all work properly. Well, that is what the Bank Extension Project is currently doing. The fact that it's doing it in a way that almost none of those millions of passengers can see is all the more ingenious. And for my mind, it's almost more impressive than some of the stuff on Crossrail because it's on the same scale, but it's being done behind the scenes of a running station, in some cases inches away from uh, trains and passengers walking past tunnels on the other side. Now, I've had the good fortune to go to King William Street, which is the access site for the the project, uh, a year before the project started, and then every year since uh, it's been running. So it's been fascinating to see them take it from uh, beautiful, disused, if damp, old station to uh, shaft rammed straight through the middle of the platforms without much um, um, care for the uh, historic artefacts through to an amazing new station taking shape. So there we go. That's where the bay platform at King William Street used to be. You can just make out, it's about third... Uh, If you were to take the station uh, platform and break it up into three sections along its length, this goes right through the middle third uh, of that platform. You can just make out that there's this walkway which makes its way around from one side of the shaft to the other. This is where you would come in, down the old steps of King William Street, and then there's a set of steps which bring you down into the shaft where this photograph is taken from, and then the walkway takes you round the other third of the platform and onto the remains of the running tunnels under the Thames. This uh, is this letterbox, as they describe it, is a twelve by six meter uh, letterbox through which every bit of equipment and every bit of spoil uh, has been um, passed through this project. So all of the enormous excavators and machinery down below came in on a crane, all the spoil carried out in hoppers. Um, So an enormous mine uh, now starting to have some of its fit out done. So this is the bottom of the shaft looking uh, north in what will be the new southbound Northern Line Tunnel. And that's looking south to the extent of the uh, new southbound tunnel. So that's waiting until later in the project when it can be broken through uh, and connected onto the existing southbound uh, Northern Line uh, tunnel. That is pointing towards the Thames and behind the photo, looking that way, is pointing away from the Thames. They are quite a way on with this. They have now uh, finished lining some of the... um, uh, some of the, the tunnel cast in situ with a, a mobile uh, shuttering system, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment, uh, and with the load-bearing concrete deck for the track laid. You may notice a blue colour in here, which is the waterproofing uh, starting to be applied. Two-stage waterproofing. You'll see white and blue in this. Uh, That's just so they can see where they've applied one coat and definitely applied the second coat without any gaps. Uh, That's looking further northbound now, so we're in the platform area. Looking, uh, Looking northbound. All initially created, of course, using shotcrete, this very rough um, sprayed concrete lining, which allows them to create these large caverns um, without needing cast lining rings. And then this is looking up from uh, what will be the new central concourse between the, uh, the, the two northern line platforms up the escalators, which head towards uh, the new uh, street level um, entrance to banks, so will for the first time have a street level presence, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment, but this will have three escalators coming down through that drive. That is the existing southbound uh, platform tunnel, which you can just see the cast iron rings of 
either side of this support. So that's with current sales bound running through and they're just exposing that ready to create the breakthrough for the new passageway off the pl um, out of that concourse into uh, the escalator uh, base. And then this is looking back towards what will be the new southbound platform. Bit of the two together. Fabulous artwork. Uh, and uh, this device is the uh, is the casting um, shutter uh, system which they have for the running tunnels. So this is mounted on a rail here and a rail here, and it means that I can cast a section, move it along, cast another section, move it along, cast another section. So rather than having lining rings which are put in and then back, uh, back filled with grout uh, to uh, to stop any voids. Uh, there are no voids because they're casting it uh, hard against the shopcrete. And there you go. Rather sharp looking tunnel. This section is too short to have been worth doing with a tunnel boring machine, far too short and they didn't have a launch site for one anyway. Uh, and so this method of, of construction is the, the preferred one nowadays for that kind of mined uh, tunnelling. Um, this little section here is just where they've been checking uh, whether the shotcrete that they've sprayed is, is actually taken and is structurally sound. The answer to that was no, not in that section, so that bit will be redone. And uh, you can see that they are quite thorough in checking out the quality of the work before uh, they put the final lining in. A bit carried away with shot creek clearly it's quite it looks a little bit like pumice um, uh, when you see it up close i was trying to capture the tiny little 45 i think 45 millimeter long strips of stainless steel which are in it which form the reinforcement so uh, you have to be careful not to touch it when it's like this otherwise it will cut your fingers uh, to ribbons um, and then this is the view looking along what will be the travelators between the central line uh, and the northern line platforms. This is where there'll be an escalator to connect the travelator at the bottom uh, right hand side to uh, the cross passage between the two central line platforms. So one central line platform there, uh, that's the eastbound and the westbound up here. So the escalators take you down away from the track along the travelator towards the northern line uh, further along the station. Oh, sorry, I've not rotated that. Uh, that is the breakout uh, from the platform, sorry, should be through 90 degrees, uh, of the westbound central line platform to connect onto the escalators. <laughs> Everybody got a crick in their neck now. Uh, and this is a rare view of um, the back of... Uh, cast iron uh, lining rings of the central line. Uh, you can see where there was a gap that's been filled by uh, grout when the, the tunnel was built. Um, so you don't often get to see the backs of tunnels, especially when they're doing their job still. There we go, there's one that's the right way up. You can see the enormous framework that has to be built to support that tunnel and take all of the thrust from the ground that's trying to break this side of the tunnel and deal with the push from the, the ground on the other side of the tunnel which is still very much there. Now you can see the men doing the delicate job of chipping out. Ductwork being laid in uh, and the back of that shield, the, the, the sorry the shuttering that I was talking about, so this is a, a shot looking through from the side of that blue mobile shuttering uh, gantry I showed you, uh, and you can see the kind of the impression panels there uh, that give it the look of something that's made out of sheet material when uh, when the concrete's cast, and they're just preparing for another pour there. Um, so this rather busy work site, they've been doing a mixture of applying the blue. Uh, waterproofing material on top of the white waterproofing material uh, and there's a little bit of work just going on in there where yet another section of uh, southbound northern line tunnel has been exposed ready to create a link through 
uh, and that will form the connection that goes into the Docklands Light Railway, which is about 40 metres in the ground uh, to the right. And again, another photo, I apologise, I should have flipped. You get to see the size of the machinery they've been lowering, lowering, down, the, uh, uh, lowering down the tunnels. Throughout the site, there's an enormous network of ventilation piping, uh, concrete piping, uh, in order to be able to get materials in uh, and to keep the workers safe down there. All, of course, gas monitored. Uh, there's another view of the, um, uh, the shuttering. And this um, is the point that they are proudly saying will become the deepest point on the network. We can have a discussion about that. Um, this is deepest below sea level, so we're already caveating. Um, and this is where the twin lift will go uh, for direct access to the Docklands Light Railway. And uh, they say the bottom of that shaft will be at 42 metres, which presumably means the bottom of the lift is at 40 metres. So I already think that uh, with Crossrail they're on a sticky wicket and I can think of at least one place on the Jubilee line that gets to 42. Uh, so anyway, um, for the moment they're claiming that as the, the deepest point. Uh, and in the meantime, fitting out this enormous set of uh, lift shafts, emergency staircases and firefighting staircases that will upgrade this station to being one of one of hopefully the best, most accessible and uh, easy to look after stations uh, on the system. Uh, so we move now to the top and towards the new entrance. So you remember earlier I talked about the uh, es escalator shaft coming up from the northern line uh, towards the new trucks in, trucks out, uh, and the different trades uh, that are building that without most people realising it. Of course, there will come a point where they have to stop doing it behind the scenes, and do a partial closure of the station in order to connect on that new southbound northern line tunnel. At that point, I've no doubt that the customers who use Bank every day will notice it very heavily and not be too impressed. However, had they not have done this kind of keyhole surgery for the three or four years beforehand, the alternative would have only been to shut bank for a good three or four years uh, and do it in a really messy uh, but slightly easier way. Uh, so it is a huge testament to the team who've taken that on uh, and an enormous passenger benefit that they have done it the hard way to make life a lot easier uh, for their commute. I'd say it's been either by opening up on tours or being able to give talks about it to show you the bits that are just too difficult to tell you on tours. 
hope you found that interesting. Uh, and thank you very much for listening and participating. Uh, particularly, I have to give a Hidden London badge of award uh, for just so many answers in one place. So, uh, well done, Just pass that one over. A round of applause for my I think the handheld mics are working. Yes, they are. Good. You weren't expecting prizes, were you? You weren't expecting bank either. Um, right, Chris will happily take some questions. If you've got a question, just put your hand up, please, and we'll get a mic to you because it is rather difficult, particularly if you're sitting behind the speaker to hear the questioner to hear what they're saying. So, who's got a question? Right at the very end. Right. Can we uh, get one along? No, it, it, it's easier if you wait for the mic because, say, the acoustics aren't always good for those behind you. Looking at King William Street Station, when I last went down there, which was 25 years old, there used to be the vaults for the Phoenix Insurance Company right at the end where you could pull out the very old policies. Now, whether that has changed from there, strangely enough, the other half used to work in that insurance company and we went in there all oh, about six months ago, but we didn't get down that far down. Uh, yes, uh, I have to say that little bit of fun is no longer available. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to quickly find uh, my photos from when I went there four or five years ago. Um, I think, yeah, there we go. I think you're probably talking about... There. There, yeah. Yeah. which, as you can see, has been bricked up. Yes. Just no fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, uh, there used to, when it was uh, converted to be an air raid shelter in the Second World War, a private one, by the way, that belonged to the office, and they got quite a lot of flack from uh, public for not opening it up. Um, but they had to um, obviously have a way in and a way out. So the original entry steps, uh, which are back that way at the end of the platform, uh, was one way. And then this doorway here and the set of uh, stairs back to the surface was the other one. But alas, <laughs> brick time. And I, that was one place where even I thought knocking through the bricks was probably not going to <laughs> yeah. be good for me. Just taking it the other side of the river... When the lab used to have that as a cable testing or fire testing of cables, have you been down that bit? Uh, I have not. Um, oh, that one's a bit blurry. Let's see if we've got a better one. There we go. Uh, the tunnels uh, long since been uh, yes, that's the bit under the tails. Yeah, uh, but if you're coming from uh, what would be like the barrow side, yeah, the the uh, lab used to have all their fire tests, which seemed rather remarkable, to see how well cables burnt there. Yeah, so I, I, and yeah, there, I, was a, <laughs> there was another bit that they'd got as uh, bunk beds and things. Yeah, I'm so the civi there was a civilian a public shelter on the, yes. on the other side originally. It does seem an odd way to go, doesn't it? Let's <laughs> test just how bad a fire with cables would be underground by putting it underground. And, yeah. Well, you, it's <laughs> even worse when you used to see the smoke coming out from, from some grills. Anyway, there you are. Thank you. Oh, it's Bill. This is going to be a tricky signalling question that's going to catch me out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you um, showed a picture of Siddy sitting in a full-size tube tunnel, but you swiftly moved on from saying where it was. Um, ooh. With cables up above. Which is why I, I do apologise. Um, um, it was Siddy sitting, what, sorry, on a... Siddy was looking up at the camera, and you said that it could be reused as a tunnel, but it looked like a full-size tube tunnel. Oh, yeah, no, I was deliberately not That's saying it, yeah. where that is because I don't like to get people's hopes up when I don't know if I'll be able to run a tour there. <laughs> oh, so you're not going to tell I could tell it you. It's actually at Green Park. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a ventilation uh, shaft at Green Park. Um, and, 
you've probably already had the answer about what else is interesting at Graham Park um, with, uh, with Dover Street uh, remains being there as well. Um, it's a phenomenally <coughs> tricky site um, and a very busy station, which is often a problem uh, if you're thinking about doing a tour there, as more gate is proving. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, sure. <clears throat> so touching on what you were just saying there, what would what are some of the issues that would prevent a site ever being a public tour? <clears throat> Thanks. Um, could you say one or two that you've looked at and failed the test? Uh, ooh, yes. Um, <laughs> I'm really going to have to think because um, I'm, I'm quite stubborn with these things and I like to think it's a, I can't do it yet because uh, I might be thinking about it or might just be having to wait until something happens. So Moorgate was a bit like that. Uh, it's a very busy station. Uh, it had the problem of being oversailed uh, by, by Crossrail with large heavy weights. Um, and so that really was just a question of waiting until one of those things went away. Can't make it less busy, uh, but um, we could, could get rid of one of the hazards. Um, the physical access is, is one of the real challenges. Having two points of access is usually quite an important one. You can't go too far away from a single point access before uh, it's going to be a problem to take public in there. Uh, and that is usually the terminal problem because uh, we do a lot of things, but we're not going to drop hundreds of millions of pounds in digging new shafts and acquiring buildings to be able to create create tours. Um, uh, sometimes large projects coming along like HS2 has forced quite a lot of change on Euston as a tour, uh, but we, we knew that when we took it on. Um, and obviously losing a building like 55 Broadway uh, uh, to, uh, it will, will impact on them. Um, the other thing uh, is that's in our mind when we're looking for a new tour is what does it add to what we've already got? So it isn't simply about is it a curious space? Has it got a good story? Uh, and is it a story that's done better somewhere else? Or is this a new one? Um, so we won't simply open up a place because it's an interesting hole in the ground because there's a relatively small number of people who want to come and look at it for that reason and there just isn't the return on the considerable investment in, uh, in researching that. Um, our patrons get to go to some of the places which are very awkward or you can only do in small groups um, uh, and just won't ever be suitable for a public tour uh, or perhaps are a little bit niche, shall we say, or there's not much there, but if you aggregate two or three together, uh, then there's kind of enough to warrant a tour. But these are all things that are quite problematic to be a public tour because you're trying to coordinate people who are unfamiliar with the spaces across multiple sites and things like that. So we, we have, it's often the operational issues which are the killer um, if a place has got a good story and we'd like to do it will generally find a way unless there's an operational killer that stops it. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I noticed we're looking around the exhibition that there was a small placard regarding the growing of vegetable and salad leaves in Clapham. And my son spent a whole day down there last week and he said it's absolutely vast but neither of us are really sure what they originally were built for, whether it can't just have been for air raids. It must have been something before. Uh, yeah, they were built purely for air raids. Oh, yeah. So um, there's a the fantastic new book out called Hidden London, which, uh, <laughs> which uh, devotes a whole chapter uh, to the creation of the deep shelters. Um, they are utterly fascinating. Um, it seems that it was the ball and bomb uh, that, that sparked it off. Um, the government had already been thinking about uh, shelters, but the day after the ball and bomb uh, cre created an uh, enormous crater in, uh, in the high street and killed around 68 people sheltering in the tube, um, the government 
got together all of the experts and the likely organisations that could build it. It was a pretty short list and LPTB was at the top. Um, and within a month, LPTB had been appo appointed to build actually 10 of the deep shelters, uh, each for a capacity of 10,000 people. Now, under construction, that was moderated down to eight for 8,000 people. That's still 64,000 people. Um, it was utterly vital to morale to do something. Um, and it's genuinely impressive, I think, that they did do that. It was an enormous cost. The thing we can't help but notice is during that period is exactly when Churchill and Bevan are in Down Street. <laughs> it's exactly the same time. They, uh, Churchill, in his own words, says he felt a huge compunction at enjoying that safety when civilians were, you know, nightly being bombed. I, I paraphrase, but it's it's uh, the word compunction was certainly his. And it, it's um, it's that precise period when they're considering how to respond to the shelter problem. Churchill knows that uh, the Parisian experience was when government left the city, so did the population, and they knew that the war would be lost if that happened. So there was a huge resolve to genuinely answer the problem of civilian shelter in order to keep uh, morale and, uh, and keep the war effort going. Uh, remember, by that point, there were only two months into the Blitz, uh, and they were building those shelters uh, a mere six weeks after they were given approval. They were in the ground in January of 1941 with 10,000 tonnes of, um, uh, of spare tunnel lining rings that London Transport had. So, uh, yeah, they were just war shelters. How long did they take to build them? It must have uh, about 18 quick. months. They, were, they started to complete them about July of 42, July, oh. August 42. Well, now I get. I know I can get thirty percent off the book. I can find out more. <laughs> I hope that will answer all of the rest of your questions. <laughs> you've got the mic, so you've got control. Um, about must be about forty years ago now. I went down um, to some tunnels with um, BBC film crew when we were filming Secret Army, that had all the bunk beds and things still in there. Um, I think it was Islington Way. And you went down a, a sort of an outer metal tunnel, a bit like Vienna, going into the sewers, cross between that and a toilet. Um, are they still there? And are they, have they still got all these iron beds up in, in all the I tunnels? I don't know if that was a kind of a local shelter. Uh, there are some of the deep shelters in the north, but not immediately springing to mind around Islington. The four in the north are Belsize Park, Camden Town, Good Street and Chancery Lane. Um, it might have been one of those, I suppose. I can't remember now. If it, so. was, if it was very deep and full of bunk beds, uh, that, those are the only things I know of in the, in the north that are civilian anyway um, that would uh, answer that description. Um, I don't know if it was for civilians because it, it, um, there were these proper metal beds about sort of two or three tiers. I... Not sure if it was for soldiers. In which case, I'm going to I'm going to phone a friend, Richard. Anything else <laughs> spring to mind? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just checking the sub Brit uh, <laughs> angle. Uh, yeah. So I suspect you in one of the shelters. It's probably either Belsize Park oh, or right. Camden Town. Uh, Good Street and Chancery Lane have not allowed much in the way of access, shall we say? Uh, okay. Shall I take one? Um, thank you. More an anecdote than a question. I was the business manager for the rebuild of Angel Station, which has pioneered basically what's going on on the Northern Line on uh, uh, Bank, a diversion of one to create more platform space. We had a lot of flack because it was a ring fence budget from the Department for Transport and someone called Portillo, whatever happened to him, was uh, on our back most of the time. We had a ring fence funds, ring fence fund, very difficult to say, even sober, uh, of 70 million quid. And we had the civil service on our back all the time. I could do it for half a crown and still take granny out to tea on the change. Um, because government don't really understand the cost and the resilience of building something subterranean, where a house has got a very, very limited sort of capacity to move. But in the underground, you've got heave, you've got streams, you've got uh, flows of acid, as we found on the northern line. And 
we had to take the, uh, the civil servants round the site. An angel was hand dug, much like the bank has been. You just could not get a TBM in there. So we took them in and we walked them down what was then going to be the longest single escalator bank in Europe. And we walked them down underneath and we explained that the tunnel was actually articulated in the middle to allow for ground heat. This was some of the technological developments we'd taken. There. And the escalator was floating. It was only anchored at the top and the bottom so that the tunnel could move independently of the escalators. And we took them up the uh, vent shaft at the end. And they come out uh, saying to each other, how do you do it for only 70 billion? <laughs> Uh, I, you've never seen such instant conversion in your life. We never had any trouble from this bloke, Portillo, again after that. But that's the nature of these things. Most of it is invisible, and to try and explain it to the government and people who only work in offices and never see it time to time is a bigger problem than the project itself. I think you may have just given me an idea about a whole new market for who else needs to pay to come on the tours. <laughs> I shall be in touch with the government in the morning. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Hello. Oh, am I next? Yeah. Um, I haven't ever been on one of these tours. I'm thinking of going at some point. Somebody told me that the cost is about £50 a tour, and which doesn't sound well. And um, also, is the only way of booking on the internet? Uh, so, um, depends on the tour that you go on as to how much it costs. So, some of them can be down in, I think, 31 is, is uh, currently the cheapest. And also off uh, a concession uh, on, uh, to bring that down a little further. It does depend which tour, though. Down Street, for example, is the most expensive one uh, at 85. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, the, the staff are almost outnumbering the, uh, the clientele in order to make that one safe. Uh, so, it, it, yes, it does depend. Um, certainly the principal way of booking is on the internet. Um, uh, that is a good question. I think we'd still do have the phone option. Do you still have, you do still have the phone option? Uh, I can't remember if it, we still got that for public as well as, but anyway, friends certainly do. So, um, yeah. It's getting easier now. When we first started running these tours, there was so much pent up interest in it. It used to be, if you didn't, uh, if you weren't ready to book in the first hour, uh, they'd all be gone. Uh, now it's a little slower. It depends, it still depends on the venue. Some are uh, more quick to sell out than others. I think the lady who was asking, uh, telling you about the bunk beds, it was Gooch Street because when I was demobbed from serving Her Majesty, we came when we got back to this country, we were down in Gooch Street Station. I can always remember it. Yes, it's um, Gooch Street. It was one of the more memorable visits. Um, so in Clapham South, we, uh, we have quite a bit of uh, graffiti on the walls from uh, visitors during Festival of Britain, say, or uh, it's used as a hostel after the war. And it's kind of, you know, the name, the year they were there, if they're French, a little escargot drawn there, or a flower. Gooch Street's a bit different. Uh, I, I couldn't show you the graffiti that's on there. It's, uh, <laughs> as I like to say, it's diagrammatic and highly instructional. Um, there was only one bit that when I was going back through my photos for the book uh, that I felt I could include thank you uh, the, um, and that was uh, one of the people who was staying there when it was a transit camp uh, in uh, 56 uh, and uh, they described it as the old there's a lot of calling it the whole uh, Godforsaken hole, miserable hole. Uh, again, lots of people saying roll on D mob uh, and uh, some poetry. Um, but yes, the common theme is it's awful uh, living here. And there seem to be quite a few people uh, using it uh, as transit camp to go out for the testing of uh, nuclear weapons. So it, the, the, um, uh, when we were testing, uh, blowing up bits of the Bahamas, uh, to test nuclear weapons, there are quite a few people sent there as their staging post to go out. Uh, so I, I was there in 
May, June, 55. Obviously so, in great mood because we, we were actually going to leave the army the next day. So knowing that you were there in 55, we can at least absolve you of knowing that you didn't, you weren't one of the people who set fire to it in 1956. Uh, it took the fire brigade nearly 24 hours to get that one under control. That's still to this day why you're not allowed to sleep in them anymore. There was another one on the end of the row there, yes. Is there any chance of a trip around North End? <laughs> oh, yes, you will see that gets a whole chapter in the book. Um, that was the one I really wanted to cross off my list and got to do as part of the photography for the book. Um, we went back to do some filming uh, for the exhibition precisely because the answer to that is uh, it, it's a grim place. Uh, it's quite small. Um, I think you could probably only take a group of probably about four at a time in there. Um, it, so you can imagine the price tag. Um, it's also, it's pretty unpleasant, you know. It's mo most of the places that we go into are now vent shafts. Uh, and so they're pretty free breathing. Um, North End is sealed. So when you shut the door, when you go in there, you are now in a pressure vessel which about every 90 seconds gets a train pressurising it. And occasionally you get two trains at the same time double pressuring it. So the experience is similar to being in a plane on takeoff and landing every 90 seconds. And sometimes it's a plane doing a rapid landing uh, when you get the two trains. Um, first time I w went in there with City, uh, she was just getting over a cold. Second time I was just getting over a cold. It is agony. Uh, if you've ever done flying when you've had a cold and you're a bit bunged up, it is very painful. Imagine doing that every minute or so. It's, it's pretty grim. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. Um, it's kind of interesting for about 40 minutes and then you really want to get out of there. Uh, but it is undeniably fascinating. And at the moment, the best I can do is say, go and see some of it lovingly uh, filmed and shot in, uh, in the exhibition. Okay, is there a last <laughs> Sorry, I can't do better. One last question. <coughs> Thanks. On, on a similar vein, when the bank project is over, is there ever any hope we might get back into King William Street? Mm -hmm. Or what's left of it? Uh, yes. So you remember I said that my, my thought process is usually not yet. Um, King William Street has the potential to be left in a reasonably accessible state. Uh, my fervent wish is that it gets a second method of egress uh, added in. And the last three times that I've been to the project, I've talked with the senior project engineer about that and also uh, the manager in charge of the overall project. So it's our understanding that it will be left, it has to be left in a accessible site for maintenance. You still have to be able to access the running tunnels. So I'll have to reinstate something within that big hole that they've created. <clears throat> the best case scenario is we persuade them uh, to have a second way, which of course would be much better for the staff if they have a route directly in from the new station. I'm nothing if not altruistic. Uh, and uh, that would also give us our second route. So, yep, working hard for you, playing the long game, and I really hope that King William Street will one day be part of the Hidden London Club. It is... It's the original. Uh, it, it's wonderful. The, the best trick that it's got up its sleeve is when you stand in the tunnels at high tide, the tunnels resonate with the sound of the propellers from the boats going over the top of you. Uh, fortunately, the first time I went there, I was warned that that's what you got. Because <laughs> otherwise, we would have been a bit, uh, bit puzzled by it. Uh, so, yeah, it, love to make it part of the club, but it's a little while away. We'll, uh, we'll end on that Thank optimistic you. note, although it does prompt me to add a, a recollection of my own. The first time that I went down, I've been mean, lucky enough many years ago now to go twice to King William Street. And the first time I went, uh, I was then public relations officer for London Transport. Um, and in my name, but not with my personal knowledge, a small group of intrepid explorers had obviously asked if they could have permission to go there. You're going to uh, this story, aren't you? 
Am I? Why? Oh yes, I'm going to. I'm going to take out the word. Yes, I'm going to take out the word. I, I've, I've told Chris this before. Um, so I go down and I see on the wall, written large, uh, in not very neat handwriting, I wrote to the public relations officer and he told me I couldn't come here, but I got here nonetheless. He is. He is a silly. And I will redact the last word because it is. It is very. It is very rude indeed. Um, Right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you came here, I suspect, uh, knowing that with Hidden London it was going to be a very informative and entertaining evening. It has indeed been, um, as you probably expected, and as certainly Chris has delivered, uh, you've been told things about Hidden London that you didn't know. Um, and we're very grateful to Chris for both the presentation and for sharing uh, some of those thoughts with us. So I'd ask you just to express your appreciation in the usual way. I'm sure you don't need me to emphasise that there is an excellent exhibition upstairs, there is an excellent book which is now available at a 30% discount, and slightly more subliminally, I'm sure you got the point that if you join the patrons of the museum, you might get to some of the places that even friends and certainly members of the public still can't get. Chris, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>